Hi, fantasy readers. This is Corinne Norton, your fellow book binger, and you are listening to the Finding Fantasy Reads podcast, where you can test out a new fantasy story every single week to find your next favorite author. Today's story stood out to me because it has a different flavor than most of the fantasy I read. It holds a world that's rich with history and culture and pairs a young girl and an old man who are eager to find both a treasure and freedom. It's written by Terry Madden, who clearly includes her interest in medieval and ancient culture and mythology in her writing. I'll be narrating today's story. Be sure to stick around to the end or check out today's show notes to see where you can find more from Terry, as well as how to enter this month's giveaway. For now, please enjoy The Wood of the Old Blood by Terry Madden. Part 1. Dorica hooked her finger through a hole in the slit-blackened curtain and eased it open. The view into the forge widened to reveal her master, fawning over a customer. She had seen mercenaries come from as far away as the olive groves of Illyria for Tajad's spears, but this tall foreigner looked too old to be a mercenary, and he barely glanced at the weapons. With more outlanders than natives in a caravan city like Petra, Dorica was used to them, but this man was fairer even than those from Sardis, his looks as exotic as his attire. An aging warrior's body dressed as richly as a Khalifa. Dismissing the boy who fed the charcoal hopper, Dorica's master, Tajad, traced his plump ringed fingers over a rack of pikes, saying to the stranger, These would do nicely to arm your personal guard, Saeed, or perhaps javelins. The ashwood is, it is said, the wood from which you shape these weapons is. The stranger clearly searched for the Nabataean word and chose one at last. Bewitched. His accent wasn't Illyrian, perhaps Thracian, but Dorica sensed that he was accustomed to making demands of men like her master. Tajad's eyebrows bounced in surprise. Ah, you know of the wood. He began reciting the pitch he used in the bazaar, taking on the affectations of an actor. Wadi Aldam is where the wood grows, a place of magic, it is true, a place where trees of rare variety spring forth from the blood of an ancient race, trees whose branches shape weapons which cannot be broken, bows and spears that cannot miss their mark. For the souls of the warriors of the Aldam al Qadim, the old blood, Live within the sapwood, and who cuts this wood? The foreigner had taken a pike from the rack and smelled the polished cedar haft. Tajad licked his lips. Not every craftsman is free with his secrets, Said. After pacing, the foreigner came to a halt before Dorica's hiding place. Though she had let the edge of the drape fall, she felt his eyes boring through it. Secrets, he said with the soothing tone of a father to a child. Yet it is said that any living man who enters the wood at Wadi Aldam lies down with its dead. How is it you cut such wood to shape your inexorable weapons? Do you call me a liar, Said? Do you question my wares? The foreigner sighed, and Dorica heard the sound of a money pouch, the chatter of a stream of coins strewn on the table. When she again peeked from behind the curtain, she saw her master twirling his beard locks. Oh, Tajad wheezed and cooed and fondled the coins. But I must protect my business, Said. I have nothing else. I must speak with this person who cuts your wood. Nothing more. Tajad's fat fingers worried at his rings. It is I who cut the wood. The stranger merely began to gather up his coins and return them to his money pouch, but Tajad stayed his hand and called, Dorica, come. Would he sell her to this milk pill stranger? To what end? As Tajad's treasure, Dorica had privileges the other slaves did not. What use did this Khalifa have for the wood? For Dorica? She backed deeper into the slave quarters. Dorica, come now! Tajad ordered again. With nowhere to hide, she stepped from behind the curtain and stood as far from the stranger as possible. What could he want with her? A girl? And she's not too far from a child at that. He laughed. 
Is this funny, Saeed? Tajad asked. It is perfect, Spearmaker. The man crossed the workshop, his head tilted as he measured Dorica. His hair was the color of a copper cookpot dulled by a lifetime of service. Half of one ear was missing, and a ragged white scar extended across his cheekbone. Gray frosted his temples and the stubble on his chin, and he wore a checkered cloak that matched his trousers. He pressed his palms together and offered her a shallow bow, as if she were a free woman. Confused, Dorica bowed in return. You walk the forest of Wadi Aldam freely? He spoke directly to her, so she averted her eyes. What would Tajad have her say? She glanced at her master for a signal, but saw only the slightest shake of his head. Should she say that she snags branches from the red cliffs and drags them over to cut? Impossible. Perhaps he would believe that as long as her feet didn't touch the ground, she could survive the curse of the old blood? Or the truth? Could her master really want her to speak truth to this foreigner? Ropes in the trees, Saeed, she said at last. Ropes? You traverse the treetops like a monkey? Yes, Saeed. What would become of this man if he tried such a foolish thing himself? You are not large, nor overly small. Still, a difficult task even for a monkey. The wrinkles at the corners of his eyes folded, as if he held back a smile. Perhaps knowing she lied made him smile. Perhaps those pale eyes could see things only the sky can see, like Dorica sleeping in a bed of fern beneath the shade of nameless trees, inhaling the breath of crocus. Dorica averted her eyes to the dirt floor and said with confidence, Ropes, Saeed. The stranger turned to address Tajad, as was proper, and dropping a single gold coin into her master's hand, said, This girl knows the wood of Wadi Aldam better than anyone alive. I would enlist her help to find something lost there long ago. Treasure, is it? Tajad scoffed. Others have sought treasure in Wadi Aldam, Saeed. It was they who first discovered the curse. I assure you, Dorica knows of no such treasure. The sky of the foreigner's eyes never left Dorica as he said, it is a treasure to none but me. Then certainly Dorica will not have found it. Tajad took her roughly by the arm and directed her to disappear into the slave quarters. From the dusty darkness, Dorica listened to the remainder of Tajad's outburst. You waste my time, Saeed. Your gold cannot buy my Dorica. Whatever your treasure might be, she is mine. Farewell. Dorica imagined the figure of the foreigner stooping to walk out the door of the spearmaker's shop, disappearing in the stink and dust of the city. What treasure could such a man seek in the wood? She slipped back into the forge and out the side door in time to glimpse the brightly checkered cloak sink into the sea of the bazaar. She followed. Dorica absently fingered the fleece of a cashmere goat, her eyes on the foreigner who had paused before a tent where he considered some incense, then some trinkets of sandalwood, and gods carved from alabaster. The dealers took his arm, led him to their goods, knowing he must have a fat pouch of gold. But his interest was cursory. He glanced over his shoulder, as if he knew Dorica had followed. Slipping between baskets of frankincense to skirt the tents, she intended to intercept him when he reached the end of the row. But when she peered from around the last tent, he was nowhere to be seen. She pulled the hood of her cloak low over her face and pushed through men who smelled of sweat and camel dung. A hand on her shoulder spun her about. You wish to hear more of my proposal? The man certainly smiled now. If you're quick about it, Zaid, I will be missed. You walk the wood freely. He took her arm and led her through the crowd in the direction of the nymphan. She felt a sudden panic. Was he stealing her? She shook him off, saying, As you say, Said, what will you pay for this treasure? Laying his palm on his breast, he said, Passage on a caravan for a slave already marked as a runaway. He touched a finger to the brand on her cheek. Caravan? To where? Wherever you wish. West to the sea, I should think. Before she could agree, the city guard parted the crowd, calling out, Detain that girl, Saeed. Go, the stranger commanded. 
I will find you. Dorica slipped behind him and pushed through the crowd in the opposite direction. She didn't get far before another man caught her arm and held her fast in spite of her biting and clawing. It was her master's manservant, Jodat. Tajad will pay well for your return. When she looked back, the foreigner had been consumed by the crowd. This beating was worse than the last. Worse still was the fact that Tajad would not let Dorica go to the wood, fearing the foreigner lay in wait to kidnap her. Do you conspire with him? Tajad asked between lashes. No, Said, she answered repeatedly. He seeks only his treasure. He was at last appeased, and her back a stinging mess. But rather than send her to the wood, Tajad put her to work shaping staves. The first day of her new work, the boy from Persepolis, Bisher, spit upon her and said, You would take my job because you cannot do your own? I take your job because you do it so poorly. She wiped the spittle from her face with the edge of his dirty kefia. Go fetch me more you would, slave. Tajad's slaves were sold quickly if they failed to perform their tasks without error. All but Dorica. For no one else could cut the wood. For this alone was she resented by the other slaves. After three weeks of shaping staves, Tajad's fat face at last spoke of surrender. He had run out of wood. He believes he can steal my treasure to find his own, Tajad scoffed. You will find this treasure, Dorica, and we will own his secret. We? She had said it before thinking. What could he mean, we? He raised his fist to strike her, then took a deep breath and said, I shall buy you some treats, some fancies, and give you a day of your own every week to do as you choose. A day of her own? The foreigner had offered her freedom, passage on a caravan to the sea. And what then? Work in a brothel or the salt pools? She imagined the sea breeze on her face, her feet cooled by the green shallows. Whatever the treasure the stranger sought, it was worth a bag of gold to him. But Dorica was worth many bags of gold, and once she found this treasure, she could strike her own bargains with whomever she chose for she would be safe inside the wood, where no one could follow. I will scale the wall in darkness, she entreated Tajad, and cut wood by night. The checkered stranger will never see me. What of leaving the wood? Tajad paced, fondling his beard locks. He'll have only to wait for you where you tether your donkey. I must return to the wood if you are to make more weapons. You must trust me again or lose your fortune. On a night when the full moon dusted the desert in powdered silver, she left the spearmaker's shop accompanied not only by Tajad's manservant Jodat, but by that sniveling manchild, Bisher. Both of them rode Tajad sway back to mule. Jodat tried to balance a javelin and guide the mule, and the bow that was slung across his back rhythmically smacked Bisher in the head with each stride. Dorica was certain the foreigner could disarm Jodat before he could cry out. It was a spectacle most wished for. Between canyon walls that had been hollowed out by generations into homes and shops, Dorica led her donkey laden with ropes and tackle, a water skin, and as much bread and dates as she could take without suspicion. She was to return with her fearsome guards before the rising of the sun, thus avoiding being discovered by the foreigner. But Dorica would not leave the wood until she had found the treasure. And there was nothing Jodat could do about that once she was in the wood, for neither he nor anyone else could follow. Above her, ladders and bridges of rope and woven palm were hung with banners, now limp and colorless in the moonlight. The street torches had not yet been lit, and the only light they passed was that of an oil lamp in the outstretched hand of a gilded goddess in the temple colonnade. Tajad was not stupid, but what did he think his two warriors could do once she had left them on the other side of the wall? With her useless guards at her back, she walked out of the city through the stone-cold walls of the Sikh and into a desert drowned in moonlight. Part 2 Dorica prepared to scale the wall with Jodad jabbering at her back. Do not forget the signal. You shall give it at dawn, and I shall return it if it is safe to come over. He handed her the chain of the wind-shaded oil lamp, 
then took up his javelin as if the foreigner would leap from the shadows. Three short whistles, she repeated, hoping that when she returned, she would find them both bound and gagged. She shed the bulky tob and veil that had concealed her identity, then scaled the wall in her cotton breeches with rope and oil lamp slung over her shoulder. Once at the top, she pulled her gear up behind her. Wadi Aldam lay black against the cupped hollow of the mountain's jagged palm, the treetops shrouded in moonlit mist, the exhalations of sleeping souls. She gave the two oafs a wave to signal all was well. They had already settled down with their backs to the wall and would certainly be asleep soon. What if the foreigner had given up on his treasure and left Petra? Once Tajad knew her plan, he would send men to the wall and to the mountain passes to be sure she could not escape. She had given much consideration to what she would do after finding the treasure, but had not expected the foreigner to have given it up so easily. Jadat had tied the mule and donkey to the gate that had been locked for centuries. Those who came to seek the curse must either scale the wall as she had, or cross the mountains to the west. Dorica had once watched two men lower a pallet from the top of the wall which landed askew, jolting a frail old woman out upon the rocks. The men had made the sign against evil and vanished, leaving their old mother to the embrace of the trees. Once they were gone, Dorica had straightened her limbs, helped her to a soft cushion of moss beneath an arbutus, and waited with her until Tree drank up her soul. Now she moves through time as the rest of us move through space, Dorica thought. It was the old woman who had taught her the name of that tree, Arbutus. She had added it to her collection of tree names learning the ones most useful for weapons first, ash, poplar, cedar, and yew for bows. Dorica's satchel was heavier than usual and required all her strength to haul it to the top of the wall. She had packed enough food for several days and wondered what she might find to eat once her dates and figs were used up. She had seen a few pomegranate trees on the dry south end, and there were pistachios scattered here and there. But game? She couldn't recall seeing any not even birds. After dropping her satchel of gear and ropes to the mossy ground below, she spidered down the wall after it. Her fingers and toes knew every jut and crack she had used daily for the past five years. For the first time, she considered that the foreigner's treasure might be too heavy to grapple over the wall, a problem she would certainly have time to resolve, considering she had no idea what she searched for. Besides, the wood covered many hundred hectares, spreading across this valley all the way to the red peaks of Hali Sanani. Once down, she pressed her back to the cool stone and held the little oil lamp out to cast its feeble glow into the black of the wood, loud with crickets. She had never been in the wood at night, and the blackness raised a shiver of fear. The arbutus tree was easy to find. The old woman's bones had long ago been covered by moss and leaf fall and Dorica lay down to sleep beneath it on a carpet of mayflowers. Perhaps she could eat crickets. Dorica awoke to a sky stained sapphire with dawn. The muffled shouts of Jadat and Bisher issued from beyond the wall, informing her that the foreigner had not come as she'd hoped. Come, little monkey, it is time to go! Slowly, her paradise became visible. She had best move deeper into the wood before they figured out she had no intention of returning. The rainless chill of winter had gripped the desert outside, but here it was spring and the trees were budding. She inhaled the moist air, fragrant with bluebells, thinking of battlefields far away where men fell beneath spears shaped from this wood. What did the trees think of such use of their flesh? They had been warriors once themselves. Dorica followed the trickle of a stream that watered the oasis. Shouts from Jadat and Bisher faded as she considered the foreigner's treasure. It was surely not gold. He had enough of that. Perhaps the wood of a special tree, or the amber formed from the sap of one of the giants. Or a sword of a warrior of the Aldam al Qadim, now surely covered by centuries of leaf fall and rust. How did she hope to find it, and when found, recognize it as a treasure? She had no more begun the search than her heart sank with the certainty of failure. She glanced back toward the wall, just visible through the trees, now warming to pink in the first light. She could leave now, return to Tajad with no saplings. Perhaps the foreigner would find her in the bazaar. But what would she tell Tajad? 
that she had done nothing but sleep all night? No. The game had already begun. Ranks of trunks as thick as temple columns marched on, their crowns spreading a solid canopy against the sky. Stands of rhododendron bloomed here in the near darkness, and ferns ruffled the wet bark of oak trees. It was almost midday when she saw a haze of pollen made real by stray shafts of sunlight. When she drew closer, she could smell it. Not pollen, but wood smoke. Her heart beat a rapid rhythm. Pilgrims never lived long enough to build a fire. Tracking north and west, she crept through the undergrowth until she reached a clearing where fingers of morning light pointed to the source of the smoke. Who else could survive in the wood long enough to build a fire? Knee-deep in gilly flowers, she watched but saw no one. She fumbled through her gear to find her limbing saw, then unfolded it. Gripping it like a dagger, she moved slowly toward the source of the smoke. In the small clearing, the ferns had been trodden and a pile of dry branches was left near the fire. It had been hastily smothered with green leaves and now belched nothing but smoke. It was beneath a bower of juniper that she found him. A young man, little older than Dorica, marked as she was, a runaway slave. His dry eyes were turned to the ceiling of green above him, but she knew he watched her from the feathery fronds of the juniper now. He must have built the fire, then lay down to die. May the wood welcome you as its own, she whispered. As if in reply, the wind sighed through a stand of evergreens. The wood had always held her softly in its embrace, and unlike this boy, had turned her loose at the end of the day to live on. How many days had she envied them? She pressed the cool eyelids closed, but knew it was she who needed the blessing. This boy needed nothing any longer. Not unlike you, is he? At the sound of the voice, Dorica spun about, brandishing her saw. The foreigner's smile was unguarded this time, and he bowed to her as he had in Tajad's shop. She managed to say, How are you here, Saeed? The same way as you, over the wall. But the curse, you must leave this instant, or, or die as this boy died? He laughed. The hunter is rarely caught in his own trap. The man stepped closer and peered at her through the juniper frond. You discovered that yourself, did you not? The day you came here, lay down and waited for the trees to take your life the way they took this boy's? He nodded toward the dead slave. Ah, but Dorica, the wood denied you. How do you know such things? Is it not written on your face? He spread his hands wide and showed his palms as he bowed. I am Orin Iver. Why does the wood let you live, Orin Iver? The same reason as you. The wood knows its own seed. We are kin. Old blood. Is that not what the people of Petra call us? Aldam al -Kadim? She laughed. My mother died a slave. Ah, but you will not. Dorica was dark like all Nabataeans, but as a slave, she might have carried the blood of many other tribes, and she dreamed, as every slave dreams, that she bore the blood of princes of faraway kingdoms. But it is said every man and woman of the old blood was slaughtered that day, Said. The old blood died here, I, but not all of us, not my ancient kin, nor yours. He squatted beside his fire, pulled the smoking leaves away, and smothered it with dirt, and she realized the smoke had simply been bait to bring her to him. You've been lighting a fire daily? He smiled, and I would have continued until Tajad let you return. But if the wood lets you walk it freely, she said, why do you need me to find your treasure? You know where to look. I know what to look for. She folded the blade of her saw into the handle. How could she be kin to men who called fire from stone and spoke the language of beasts? But there was a reason the wood let her live, and Orin Iver as well. Perhaps what he said was true, that the old blood ran in her veins. When she looked up, he had started away into tree shadow. Come, he said. If we are to find it, we must start looking. What is it we look for? The bones of a powerful magician. Aya is her name. The wood is full of bones, Said. 
We will know these bones, said Orin Iver. How? For giving this slave's impertinence. They guard a treasure. You're from Illyria, Dorica said over her shoulder. She pushed through a hedge of lilacs into a pocket meadow she had never seen before. She was leading Orin Iver around the perimeter of the wood, where most of the fallen pilgrim's bones could be found. Farther north. She held a blooming branch so it would not slap him in the face. There's nothing but mountains and wolves north of Illyria. Mountains and wolves and the old blood, he said. Those who survived the massacre here numbered less than fifty. When she looked back at him again, his pale eyes found hers. We are no longer fifty, but fifty times fifty. A tribe of children without a past, without the wisdom of elders. Those who died here in this valley, they carried our history, our wisdom, our poetry, our songs, our magic. Without them, we are no different than Illyrians. Like everyone, Dorica knew the legend. Upon a time, the old blood, the Aldum al Kadim, had fought beside the Trojans against the Achaeans. When Troy fell, the old blood fled into the desert, pursued to this valley, where the Nabataeans cut them down. From their blood, the trees grew, and anyone who entered the wood would fall to their curse to sleep with the old blood. But the tale said no one had survived. You can call the wind to fill your sails, Orin Iver? She made no attempt to hide the mockery in her voice. Or call the sea to rise and cover the land? He laughed. I told you, such skills were lost. The last of the Druada died here, and with her, their magic. You came to find magic? I've traveled three years to reach this place, he said. What I came to do, I cannot do alone. I need your help, Dorica, for no one else in this vast desert of Aram can walk this wood but you and me. It was late in the day when they reached the far end of the valley. Dorica thought of Jodat and Bashur. They would have returned to Tajad by now. What would he do? Send the city guard? Here the wood climbed into the lap of the mountains, and the soil thinned to become parched red stone. She had taken Orin Iver to the bones she knew, the oldest being nothing more than black twigs recognizable only by the yellow teeth. With each, he touched the bones, searched the ground around it, and declared it not that of the magician. Dorica was unsure of what sign he sought, and she soon came to believe he didn't know himself. We're on a fool's hunt, she stated, then corrected herself. With respect. You don't know what you seek, and I know less, and when we walk out of this wood, Jodat will kill you for your gold and take me back to Tajad. You cry surrender after but one day? What kind of hunter are you? I'm no hunter. I'm a slave. But he was right. This one day had felt like a week. The task is impossible, Said. Orin Iver just grinned at her. He was a madman, surely. We'll stay here tonight, he said. Dorica dropped her pack. Perhaps her eyes were playing tricks on her, but she thought she saw a movement among the rocks on the ridge. Not here. She stood and shouldered her satchel. We need to go deeper into the trees. Their supper consisted of dates she had brought and apples Orin Iver had found in the wood. Dorica asked him, Why must it be you who seeks the treasure, Said? She felt her impertinence would offend him, but she needed to know. Who are you among your people? They are mine, and I am theirs, he said with a sad smile. I am their king. Forgive this slave's rude curiosity. She got on her knees and pressed her face to the earth, but his hand was on her arm, urging her to rise. You and I are no different, he said. A king is a slave to his people's future, nothing more. He handed her the apple she had dropped, brushing off the leaves. Now tell me, Dorica, there must be other places in this wood that might hide bones. Bones as old as Aya's must be nothing but dust now, as old as the trees around us. So her bones must be set apart, he said, protected somewhere. Dorica thought of the bones they had found that day, some with trees growing through and around them. This magician you seek fell with the rest of the warriors? The bards tell us that before the survivors fled this valley, 
they laid Aya's body to rest with her treasure. Then she will not be lying amongst the trees. Perhaps not. She will be in a tomb, Dorica said. What people would leave the body of their most honored out for the jackals, Said? That night, Dorica fell asleep thinking about all the hidden places in this vast green wood and wondering what dreams Oren Iver would dream. Dorica and Oren Iver followed the stream's meander through the middle of the grove to a narrow slot canyon thick with willows. It would be carved into soft stone such as this, she explained to him, running a hand over the smooth, cool stone of the canyon, like the tombs of Petra. Oren Iver had described the way his people buried their dead. They built a hall under the earth where they laid them out with their finest possessions, but each hill they had found was just a hill, with no passage inside. At last, she had thought of the ravines that ran from the western mountains like deep tracks from mighty claws. The walls here were a palette of layered colors, like a winter sunset, but unmarred by human tools. Perhaps there was no time for tunneling into stone, he said, surveying the high rock faces. We must move quickly. If Tajad's men are above us, we'll be snared birds. They waded up the middle of the stream until the canyon narrowed so that Dorica could touch both walls at once. The willows no longer found soil for their roots here, and when she looked up, she saw only a jagged slice of the impossible blue sky. Snared birds, indeed. The canyon ended in a rounded bowl. The stream that fed the grove had its source here, seeping from under a wall of sandstone. She retraced her steps to the opening of the bowl and looked up. Crowning the cliff was a single tree whose roots writhed and grasped at air and stone, reaching for the water far below. Its bark was the richest stirring of reds and umbers, and the silver leaves shivered on limbs that shared the trunk with branches long dead. That tree, she pointed above Oren Iver's head, knows. Knows what? Where your magician's bones lie. Why that tree? Do you see any others on the ridge? Growing from solid rock? How did that tree soul get up there? From whose blood did it sprout? She led him back to the welling spring water. On her knees in the wet sand, she began to dig, saying, Your ancestors didn't use tombs, Said. They used trees. It didn't require much digging before the sandy bottom of the shallow pool gave way beneath them. A deep, natural cistern was revealed, and as the silt and sand of a thousand years began to settle, the water cleared. Still, no bottom could be seen, though the water was as clear as rain. Oren Iver stripped to his checkered trousers and stepped into the pool. On his pale back and chest, the cross-hatched glyphs of old battle scars turned pink and goose-fleshed. He treaded water with a rhythmic sweep of his long arms. Dorica had never been in water deeper than a bath, and then only rarely. Come, he said, we have not reached the source yet. Leaving her sandals at the water's edge, she stepped into the pool which quickly became too deep to feel the bottom and she scrambled to pull herself back to the sandy bank. You don't swim. Forgive me. Come, climb on, he said, and motioned for her to get on his back. She did, locking her arms around his neck. Hold your breath, he said, and they went under. She felt the surge of his strength and the easy glide of his strokes. Before she needed a breath, they broke the water surface inside a cavern. By thrice fifty names, she muttered. From a fissure in the rocks above, a blade of sunlight sliced through the darkness of a cavern, cleaved by roots from the tree that had forced its way through solid stone. The roots snaked down in a tangled fall to bury themselves in the soft, damp earth of the cavern floor. Taking Oren Iver's offered hand, he pulled her from the water to stand, dripping, beside him. She took in a lungful of the earth's richness and pushed her wet hair from her face. As her eyes adjusted to the dim light, she made out a subtle pattern on the cavern wall. Three red spirals locked together and black handprints arrayed around it like stars. Three spirals? What does it mean? When he didn't answer, she turned to see him kneeling at the far end of the chamber. As she drew closer, her breath stopped. Beneath a tangle of roots, she could just make out the rags that had been a tunic of checkered fabric hanging from a jumble of bones. A root had found its way into an eye socket of the skull to exit through the jaw. At the neck, another root held a golden torque tightly in its grasp. 
Dorica felt for Orin Ever's shoulder. Is it? Aya. He said the name as if it were a prayer. The treasure? Where is it? Orin Ever drew his dagger and hacked at the roots, making little headway. Do you have your saw? In my bag. He took her back through the underwater entrance to retrieve it, but before they dove to re-enter the cave, she heard a stone skitter down the rock face from above. She may have heard a man's voice, or a bird. They've come, she said. Perhaps it's a goat, a stray. But the look he gave her said he didn't believe his own words. Once inside, he set to work, sawing through roots as fat as his forearm, taking care not to disturb the bones held in its embrace. The smell of sap from the roots filled the cavern with a heady perfume like the strong resin of myrrh. Dorica watched the shadows cast from the crack high above, marking time. She saw flickers, a bird, maybe, or a man. If those were Tajad's men, they would certainly hear them. Will they climb down the cliff? Orin Ever whispered, wiping sweat from his brow on a bare arm. We can hope they'll be too afraid. The narrow canyon that had led them here marked the edge of the wood. Beyond the ridge lay rugged desert mountains. If men were here, they had circled the wood over mountainous terrain to reach this place. Their presence could only mean there were more, positioned around the perimeter of the wood. If they do climb down, she insisted, they will certainly die. They don't need to climb down. They need only to wait for us to leave this cave. He was right. Birds in a snare, she repeated. Then we must wait and leave in darkness. Aye, said Orin Eber, parting the last of the woven sarcophagus to reveal the ivory white of Aya's ribcage. Her hands, a tangle of slim yellow bones, rested together over her breastbone, untouched by the decay that had taken her flesh. A beaded pouch lay near the base of her spine. Dorica imagined it had once been clutched in Aya's hands and wondered how the leather bag had endured when the woman's flesh had not. The bards sing of Aya's sacrifice, Orin Ever whispered. His hand met the pouch and the glass beads that adorned it fell, scattering and flashing at Dorica's feet. She made the sign against evil, for she had been taught that to disturb the dead could only bring their retribution. Orin Ever opened the pouch and produced a rounded object covered with something like black tar or tree sap. The treasure? Dorica asked. He nodded, and with his knife blade, peeled the casement of hardened sap away to reveal a seashell, white and ribbed and closed tightly. A shell? The treasure is a shell? It's what's inside, he said with wonder in his voice. He opened it slowly, reverently. Inside, resting in a nest of golden hair, was a seed the size of a juniper berry, but the color of dried blood. He lifted it to the light, and Dorica saw two feathery appendages that reminded her of a dragonfly's wings. She'd seen seeds like this before, thistle seeds with white umbrellas, elm and birch seeds with papery skirts that sailed the breeze in great white clouds until they found open ground in which to root. You must promise me, Dorica. In that moment, she knew she would promise him anything. Yes. Help me plant this seed. This is your treasure, Orin Ever? It must be. A light danced in his eyes. And you know what will grow from it? I know it will make my people whole. That's all I need to know. When night finally fell, they left the cave. It was impossible to exit the pool without splashing, so they waited under an overhang of stone for some time before moving forward. Orin Ever took her hand and led her soundlessly across the bowl of open ground. They would feel their way between the great slabs of stone that rose on either side, but before they reached the narrowing, the first arrows fell. The archers had taken aim at the sound of their footfalls, and so the arrows fell half a step behind them. All but one. That one found Dorica's thigh and buried deep. She cried out, stumbled, and Orin Ever gathered her up and carried her. Arrow shafts clattered against stone and thudded into damp soil as Jodat's voice echoed through the canyon. If you come with me now, there will be nothing but forgiveness, little monkey. Tajad is a generous master. Forgiveness and the whip, like a father who holds a sweet in one hand and a scorpion in the other. A fire spread from the arrow to the rest of her leg. 
Each step Oren either took racked her with pain. When they reached the cover of the trees, he lay her down. Dorica looked back toward the ridge. A torch flared there, revealing the dark silhouettes of at least three men. She could surrender to Jawdat now and leave Oren Ivar to plant his seed, go back to the life she had always known. But what would become of him? What help could she give in the planting of a seed? In the darkness, Oren Ivar was feeling the arrow shaft lodged in her thigh. It didn't strike bone, he said. I'm going to push it through. You must be strong, Dorica. In the dim light, his eyes flashed. She placed all her attention on those eyes as he snapped the fletching from the shaft and pushed until the pain took her into a pool of unfeeling silence, deeper than the water in the cave. Part 3 Dorica awoke beside a fire. Her leg was wrapped in strips of checkered cloth, and a dull ache had replaced the fire there. Oren Iver sat beside her, turning the shell over in his hand. How will you leave this wood with the seed? Dorica asked. I won't. Oren Iver tossed the bag of gold to her. It hit the ground with a thud, coins spilling out. Once it's planted, I shall stay. This will buy your way onto any caravan you choose. She found every stray coin and returned it to the bag, then tied it tightly closed and slipped it inside her tunic enough to buy her way to freedom and more. But how would she get out of the wood and make her way to a caravan? Tajad's men would simply take it from her. Why do you need my help to plant a seed, Saeed? Just dig a hole in the earth and drop it in. The tree around you did not grow from seeds simply buried in the earth. They grew from the blood of men. A weight like the sack of gold settled in her gut. She understood what he intended to do. I need you to keep watch for a while, he said. How do you know what must be done, Saeed? My dreams instruct me. And if they're wrong? Then I shall plant the seed and water it. Dorica turned Aya's prize over in her hand, letting the sunlight catch the corrugation of the shell, seeing in the discoloration the faintest whirls. They formed the same design, or she imagined, as the one she'd seen on the cavern wall three spirals that joined in the center. Oren Iver said it was the symbol of the three worlds, but which three she did not know. Dorica could only wonder how a seed could carry the wisdom of a woman long dead. Grain stored for too many winters never grows, she told him. He ignored her. The place he had chosen to plant the seed was as far from the mountainous perimeter as possible in a clearing that saw the sun for more than half the day. Dorica went on. This seed, how many winters do you think it's been in that cave? Seven hundred, he said, without looking up from his work. He had sharpened a stick to dig a hole for the seed. But have you ever known the wood to suffer a winter? Dorica had been helping herself to saplings in the wood for six years. It was true. She had never seen colors turn or the leaves fall. Flowers bloomed and seeded all at the same time. He examined his work, a hole as deep as his forearm, then sat down beside her and drank from his water skin. Did you dream last night? she asked. That I did. He wiped at his mouth with a dirty hand and his eyes met hers. Dorica, you must swear to me on your blood that you will keep watch here until the moon waxes next. When the faintest pairing of moonlight appears in the west, you'll cut a branch from this tree and you'll place it in my hands. What tree? It is but a seed. How will it be a tree in a fortnight? Please. I ask only this of you, nothing more. He knew as well as she that if she left the wood now, Tajad's men would have her, perhaps not immediately, but within days. Even if she made it into the mountains, they would be waiting at every caravanserai for leagues around Petra. How could she have been so foolish as to think she could walk from this wood with a bag of Oren Iver's gold? I swear on my blood I will keep watch, and when the moon waxes to the barest sliver, I shall cut a branch from the tree that is yet to be, and place it in your hands, Oren Iver. He gave her a satisfied smile, and she placed the shell on his waiting palm, then followed him to the hole he'd dug. He took the seed from its bed of yellow hair and held it to the western sky, now colored with sunset. He placed the seed in the earth. 
Dorica knelt beside him and helped push the black soil over it. With a glance at the fading light in the west, he drew his dagger, his knuckles black with dirt, and laid it across his wrist. Dorica stayed his hand. Did your dream say you will come back? My dreams said much more. Remember the branch, Dorica. She swallowed the lump in her throat. If you say I must. She felt hot tears behind her eyes. You must. The cut he made was quick and deep, and he sang while the black earth drank down his blood like wine. It was dawn. Dorica remained hidden in the trees where she could just make out the form of Jodat on the wall. She'd been watching him for several days, dangling his legs over the wall, dropping the peels from his pomegranates to the soft moss below. She could wait them out. There were apples in plenty and dates from the palms in the south. Tajad couldn't keep men and slaves on the edge of the wood forever. When they left, she would too. The bow bent smoothly as she drew back the makeshift string, really a lace from Oren Iver's sandal. Her aim wasn't nearly good enough, nor her arrow shaft straight enough, to hit Jod at from here, though since she'd made the bow, she'd done little else but practice, and wait beside Oren Iver for a tree to sprout a tree he had said would grow to fullness before the crescent moon returned. That had been a week ago. The moon waned, and still Jada and the others watched the wall and the passes, and still Oren Iver's body lay upon the black mud where he had bled out. Dorica was afraid to move him. She would wait until the moon waxed to a crescent again. Then she would bury him, shoot Jada from off the wall, and leave this place with Oren Iver's gold. But today, there were others here. She could hear them on the other side of the wall, one of them barking orders. She would know that voice anywhere. Tajad. The oak planks of the gate that had been unopened in 700 years looked as strong as the day it had been locked. Hammered bronze straps had left dark stains on the ancient timber. The hinges groaned and the seam where the two doors met showed sunlight for a brief moment as a ram struck it. What did they plan to do when they'd forced the gate open? She climbed a fat beech tree to better see, the wound in her thigh nothing more than an insistent ache. It took half the morning for them to get through the gate, and when they did, it swung free and a gathering of hired men stood there, gleaming with sweat. They dropped the ram and the first among them backed up into the men behind him. Who would walk in first? They parted as a slight young man walked between them. When he reached the open gate, he halted. Bisher, beardless and bareheaded and wearing nothing but the white tunic of a pilgrim, he looked even younger than he really was. What can you hope to do, you fool? She whispered. Bisher stood there, looking like a prophet in the doorway of paradise. Dorica could see torches behind him. As Bisher stood there, clearly considering a command he'd been given to enter the wood, the birds came, thousands of them. Dorica was forced to cover her face with her arms or be struck by wings and talons. The hired men cried out in fear and fell to their knees. Tajad set to kicking the cowards, commanding them to get to their feet while birds poured through the gate as if they flew out of the heart of the rising sun. They wheeled and called and disappeared into the wood, and Dorica was suddenly aware that she had never seen birds in the wood before. It was as if the gates had been built to keep them out. A barrel, rolled from the top of the wall, struck the rocks below with a crash. Another hit the soft ground and rolled away into the trees, leaving a trail of what smelled like sulfur and black oil. When Dorica looked again at Bisher, he had a torch in each hand. She dropped from the tree and moved closer. No! she cried out. Bisher, stop! Come with me, Dorica! Tajid called from behind him. Come, and we'll go home. I shall spare this boy and we shall feast. You would burn the wood that has made you wealthy? It means nothing to me if I cannot harvest it. He waited. Bisher stood frozen. When Dorica made no reply, Tajad said, Go forth, Bisher. Greet the gods of this place for me. The boy took his first step onto a carpet of blooming crocus. She couldn't see his tears, but heard his simpering. The torches quavered in his hands as he stepped forward. Dorica drew her bow. She must be quick. 
The closer he dropped those torches to the gate, the less likely they were to touch the scattered oil. He will die anyway, she told herself. He took another step, and still she could not release the bowstring. Fisher, she called. Drop the torches and stamp them out. He shook his head, closer now. The old blood will welcome you, but not if you burn them out. I just want to be free, he blubbered. I just want to leave this place. And you will. She moved closer, still concealed by an army of trees. But not if you burn the wood. Come to me. Hand me the torches. He halted at the edge of the pooling oil. With a pained look, he held both torches in front of him. No! Dorica dropped her bow and ran, reaching him just as his hands opened. She caught one torch, then stamped out the one that fell on a mossy stone. Taking his hand, she cried, Come with me! But a shower of arrows fell, and the next moment, he was a fallen weight behind her, arrows in his back, his hand still clutching hers. The next flight of arrows carried fire. As they struck the ground all around her, balls of flame erupted. Blinding heat seared her bare arms, and she ran toward the cover of trees, a wall of flame at her back. Dorica threaded her way through the trees, retracing her marks that would lead her through leagues of forest back to the clearing. Orin Iver, she cried out as if he could hear. A flock of partridge startled from under a mound of blooming rhododendron. Their flight scattered red petals and pollen that covered her in a golden powder. Behind her, black smoke boiled. Birds of every kind raised a chattering as they took flight, and she frightened cranes into a cloud of white wings. When she finally reached the clearing, she found Orin Iver sitting with his back against a tree no thicker than Dorica's forearm. He looked like a traveler who had but stopped to rest. When she had left him at dawn, he was pale with death. Now, as Dorica drew closer, she saw his fair skin flushed as if he slept. The stubble of his gray-red beard prickled her hand when she touched his cheek. A linnet perched on his shoulder, tipped its tiny head and peered at her one-eyed. It picked at his hair, drawing a few strands in its beak. The bird ruffled its feathers before taking flight to the branches of the strange tree at Orin Iver's back. Dorica pressed her ear to his chest. The faintest breeze blew inside him. His skin was cool but not cold, and the wound on his wrist had healed into a tight red scar. Wake up, Orin Iver, she pleaded, her palms on his cheeks. The possibility occurred to her that he slept such a deep sleep that his dreams became real. Orin Iver had dreamed the tree to life, and if she woke him, perhaps she shouldn't try, not until the moon turned dark and waxed to a sliver again. Only then was she to cut the branch and place it in his hands. But the fire, what about the fire? They opened the gate, she said aloud. They opened the gate and the birds came back. She circled the tree. The trunk had grown in the minutes that had passed, and within an hour it was fatter than the baker's thigh, but gnarled as if it had pushed through stone. Its bark was the color of forge embers and charcoal, the color of Orin Iver's hair. New leaves of silver green drank in sunlight, and in places the bark had peeled away to allow the tree's girth to thicken and grow. Doric has sat beside Orin Iver, watching smoke curl over treetops to the east. By the end of the day, Aya's tree had reached the top of the canopy, lifting its crown to the sun. But night brought a distant orange blaze that could only be moving toward them. Dorica took the bag of gold she had carried inside her shirt and tucked it back in Orin Iver's tunic. Wherever we go, we go together, Said. Through the night, Dorica marked the advance of the fire. Perhaps the trees could do battle against it, heavy with water as they were. Before dawn, she saw that it had advanced perhaps a league, and the breeze that always bellowed with the rising of the sun now hastened it. The twisted trunk of the tree was as thick as three men now, its tousled crown the green silk of a paladin's tent. The moon will be snuffed like a lamp tonight, she told Orin Iver. In three days, you shall have your branch. You dreamed the tree. Now you must dream a storm, Said. Like your druada of old, call the wind. At midday, she climbed into Aya's tree. The fire would reach them by nightfall. As she was climbing down, she spied the linnet's nest, 
lined as it was with Oren Ivar's hair. The bird had no fear of her, but sat in its cozy home, watching the coming of the fire, just as Dorica did. You must fly back to the halls of the gods, little one. Tell them the fire will finish the old blood at last. Those who have waited these long centuries for Oren Ivar to come. Go, now. As if in response, the linnet flew to a branch, alighted on Dorica's shoulder long enough to warble a soft note in her ear, then took wing. In a loud voice, she commanded the sky as if it were her right. Clouds arise in the north! When she reached the ground again, she commanded Oren Ivar as if he could hear. Feel the cool mist on your face, Oren Ivar. Feel the weight of rain in the clouds' black bellies. She leaned close to his ear. Dream of the north wind. Hours passed, and the smoke began to choke her. She soaked Oren Ivar's checkered cloak in water from the stream and draped it over them. When she lost consciousness, she could not say, but her mind returned to her at last, or she was dead and seen with the eyes of her soul. She saw a glow piercing the fabric of Oren Ivar's cloak. It was either dawn or the raging flames. Lifting the cloak, she saw the eye of the sun through the smoke that now curled back toward the east. A breeze blew cool across her wet skin. A north wind herded the fire back the way it had come. The rain fell in brief cloudbursts. By nightfall, Dorica could see the wall far to the east, for the wood that had once hidden it from view was nothing but charred trunks now. Even from this distance, she could see the men on the walls. There would be more in the mountains. But Oren Ivar and the linnet had dreamed the wind and rain, and now the northern reaches of the wood were all that was left. Looking up into the branches of Aya's tree, Dorica was greeted by a cacophony. The tree and the woods around it had escaped the flames, and now it was heavy with chattering birds. You came here for Aya, Dorica told Oren Ivar. Will you dream her, too? Another night passed before the moon shone a silver sickle. Dorica opened her sapling saw. She had chosen the branch not long after finding the tree, but since then it had fattened like a kid goat at its mother's teat. The tree had twisted into what Dorica imagined was a hand, its five fingers having been clutched into a fist for too long, now peeled open, reaching for the sky. The branch she had chosen grew from the red-knuckled forefinger. She would have to climb for it now. Her ropes served her well. The sawdust drifted and covered Oren Ivar in the fragrance of cinnamon and camphor wood. Beneath the red and black bark, the wood inside was moon white. When the branch cracked and swung free, Dorica made the last cut through the clinging bark to let it fall. Once on the ground, she found the branch tangled in nearby willows. Should she trim it? She decided Oren Ivar would want all of it, even the sprigs of leafy green. His arms weren't stiff when she lifted them. His hands opened easily. She nestled the branch between his palms, and as she did, his fingers closed around it. His pale knuckles flushed to pink, and he gasped like a grounded fish. The veil of sleep burned away from his eyes as they found Dorica's. You're still here, he said. As I promised. She smiled, and he returned it. She helped him to his feet. He staggered, and she studied him with an arm around his waist. You've found some magic after all, she said, following his gaze to the tree. To grow such as this in a fortnight, magic indeed. Squinting up at the tree, he laughed, and his wild eyes met hers. He offered his palms in that strange bow. Then he saw the destruction the fire had wrought, and Dorica explained all that had happened while he had slept. But Oren Ivar, you've traveled three years to lie down and dream beneath a tree? I thought you came for Aya. He took her shoulders in a firm grip. The dream's not done. He circled the tree, the branch in one hand and the other on the tree. He sang, and as he did, a breeze gathered in the wood. It rolled through the oaks and lifted the ash from the remains of the forest beyond. The breeze became a wind. It carried leaves and birds in a building spiral, and Dorica saw winter grip each tree in turn. In the space of a breath, Leaves paled from glossy green to flame gold. The gathering wind picked at the leaves, taking them not to the ground, but to the sky until the oak wood stood naked, wearing their bones like old men. Dorica clutched his arm. What's happening? Tell me. 
She's coming. The branch in Orin Ever's hand swelled with buds, and as a nearby stand of ash trees sent their leaves to the sky, the flowers on Orin Ever's branch opened. They smelled of osmanthus and sweet orange, as if in answer, the tree produced buds of its own, pale stars with a circlet of long stamens, plump with pollen. The wood was engulfed in a tempest with the tree at the center. The wind drew closer and Dorica's hair billowed with Orin Ever's cloak. A gust stripped petals from the flowers to whirl in a sweet flurry. When she looked at Orin Ever, he was smiling, petals caught in his hair and the stubble of his cheek. She clung to him, feeling she would be carried off by the wind, but his body shuddered and a dart-like spear tip peeked from his chest. His eyes met hers, and she saw the dream fade. In the charred forest to the east, a man stood. A burnt wood could do him no harm, but they could come no closer, for they had reached the edge of the living trees. Others appeared, and another shower of their light, long-range peltas spears drove like needles into the soft ground and glanced off the tree. Dorica held fast to Orin Ever and dragged him to the other side where she eased him to the ground. Take it. His words were a faint wheeze as he thrust the branch out to her. I don't know what to do. Take it. Her hand closed around the branch, and as she did, she felt her feet grow roots, felt the rustle of wind and leaves as she would the hairs on her arms. Her skin became bark, her heart pumped sap, not blood. Her face drank in the sky and cradled in the crook of her arm was a linnet's nest lined with Orin Ever's hair. She closed her eyes and let words spill from her lips. Their meaning settled in her bones. When she opened her eyes, red seeds danced on dragonfly sails, twirling on through ash and leaves, carried by the wind into the far reaches of the veil. With one word from Dorica, the wind fell still. The air, so full of seeds, dropped them, fluttering to the ground. They fell in mossy shadows among drifts of ash and charred bark in the rivulets fed by the spring. The oaks to the west caught the seed in their craggy bark, then the cedars to the south. Limbs became limbs, tresses of leaf became tresses of men, unshorn in seven hundred years, and feet long planted in the earth stepped forth with the worn sandals of warriors who had battled for Troy. Dorica found she could move her feet. Her eyes were her own again, and she gazed at the spearmen at the edge of the living wood. They had ceased their attack and stood watching the old blood awaken. One by one, the Peltasts fled. From the wood they came, streaming between charred trees to stand before Dorica. They laughed, they sang, and their eyes danced with the wonder of waking. Men in boiled leather breastplates armed with spears and swords of bronze, and women, no less armed, made their way to her. These were no ghosts. They circled Aya's tree and Dorica, who stood beneath it. A woman stepped forward, her hair a pale cloud veiled with fallen leaves. She wore a torque and her breastplate was stitched with a medallion of hammered silver, three spirals meeting in the middle. She moved like the tree, and in that moment, Dorica knew her. Aya knelt before Dorica and offered her palms in that strange gesture. She spoke in the tongue of the old blood, and Dorica understood. Come, she told Dorica, I will take you north, as Orin Ever would have it. With that, each man and woman followed Aya in greeting Dorica, then bowed to Orin Ever. His flesh had begun to cool. This time, he did not sleep but Dorica hoped he dreamed. She found the pouch of gold tucked into the folds of his tunic, and touching his cheek one last time, looked up into the dome of green. Creamy blossoms fell and drifted over him like sand covering a city. One red seed fluttered by and caught in his hair. Dorica found the seashell cast off among the tree roots and tucked the seed inside. The Aldam al Qadim honored their dead and bore the body of their king. Orin Ever to the tomb that had been Aya's. There, Dorica placed the shell in his hands, folded as they were over his breast. With flocks of birds leading the way, Aya took Dorica's hand, and together they led the ranks of the old blood through the open gate to the road that would take them north to Illyria 
and the mountains beyond. I hope you enjoyed listening to The Wood of the Old Blood by Terry Madden, narrated by Corinne Norton. If you want to read more by Terry, go to terrymaddenwrites.com to find more of her books. This month's giveaway includes an ebook for Three Wells of the Sea, the first book in her high fantasy series. So be sure to enter to win at findingfantasyreads.com slash giveaway. As always, I will have links for both those sites in the show notes. If you haven't already signed up for the Finding Fantasy Reads newsletter, you'll want to get in on that. Each week you get an email letting you know what episode has been added, but I also include links to deals on audiobooks, new releases, and freebies from our featured authors, as well as anything else that I think might interest someone who enjoys fantasy audiobooks and short stories. You can sign up for the newsletter at findingfantasyreads.com. Thank you all for listening, and happy reading. Happy reading.